Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4, and I'm going to give you Solomon's seven wisdom rewards, the incredible payoff for wisdom. Proverbs 4 verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. With all you're getting, God says, get wisdom. The difference between seasons in your life is wisdom. The difference between success and failure, wisdom. The difference between a good marriage and a sucky marriage, wisdom. The difference between poverty and prosperity, wisdom. The difference between your present and your future, wisdom. You can't change your life until you change your wisdom. So wisdom, or lack of it, is creating the present circumstances of your life. So you will not change your future until you change what you know. Solomon was the son of David, and a figure in history known for his amazing wisdom and wealth. Rulers of nations came to Solomon to seek his wisdom and his financial counsel. And to this day, the lives of countless successful men and women have had their lives and destiny shaped by Solomon's wisdom and principles. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison, Clara Barton, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Sam Walton, Walt Disney, Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, Steven Spielberg, just to name a few of the people who have used Solomon's wisdom. Incredible outcomes are never achieved without it. Unfortunately, less than one in a thousand people even use it. The good news is it's a skill that can be easily learned. It can be used by anybody regardless of race, nationality, culture, background, IQ, or education. It can bring financial harvest and the breakthrough you're looking for in 2015. What can do that? Wisdom. In fact, in a few weeks, I'm going to preach a message I did for the men's breakfast a year or two ago called Stop Doing Dumb Things. <laughs> you got to wise up. And everybody can. That's what's really great. And wisdom will work for everybody. It, it, it works for a non-Christian. You, you can be a non-Christian and have wisdom and have a good marriage. You, you can be a Christian on your way to heaven and have a stinky marriage because you're just dumb. You, you don't use wisdom to stay married. You can be a Christian and broker than the Ten Commandments and be a pagan and have abundance. We're not talking about going to heaven now. We're talking about bringing a little heaven down on earth. And to do that, you have to have wisdom. Wisdom. You've got to have wisdom for about anything to succeed at. So everybody can learn it. This golden key to success, Solomon says, is diligence. Diligence. Proverbs 2, verse, verse 9. Do you see a man diligent in his business? He will stand before kings or people in authority. Most people think they know what diligence means, but I'll bet nothing could be further from the truth. It runs contrary to our human nature. And our human nature, what's common to it is our desire for instant gratification. We want as much as we can get, as fast as we can get it, as cheap as we can get it, with as little effort as possible. That's our human nature. True diligence is a persistent and hardworking effort in doing something with absolute excellence all the time. Not sometime, all the time. Some synonyms for diligence, meticulous, conscientiousness, thoroughness, carefulness. But those alone don't fully convey the meaning of diligence. To fully understand Solomon and what he meant by the word diligent, we've got to add to it Proverbs 20, verse 11. Even a child is known by his doing, whether his work is pure or whether it be right. The two key words are pure and right. That word pure here is not an ethical or moral word. It's about work in its purest form. That's the pure side of diligence. Let's talk about what that means today's language. It's investing your days, your hours, and your minutes into that which brings the best and highest return on your time and effort that's invested. It's a pure investment. It's bringing the best out of your work, out of your time, out of your money, out of your energy. That's the pure side of diligence. The other side of diligence is the right side. It's not just working with persistence at something, it's working smart. For example, 
you could be persistent in cutting down a tree with a hammer. And you probably never get it down. You're not working smart. You're persistent, but you're really not efficient. So you need diligence to be efficient. You need a saw or you need an axe. So to do something right means doing it right efficiently and effectively. Doing it on time to the highest possible standards, regardless of what is expected, you always go above what's expected. It means bringing creativity, persistence, and even other people, outside resources into your effort to achieve extraordinary outcome. It takes teamwork to make a dream work. You don't do it by yourself. You need outside resources, wisdom, and help. With diligence, your highest level of accomplishment can be realized. You can turn an average marriage into a great marriage. You can turn a good career into an incredible one and a failing business into a successful one with diligence. Uh, another reality show, two of them, The Prophet. Anybody ever watch that? The guy takes over businesses. Hotel Impossible. How about that? Anybody watch that? What y'all watch? <laughs> These are just great shows. They, the Hotel Impossible, this guy goes in to take failing hotels and why people don't book and why they're losing money. And he takes the camera and he shows you the bed bugs. He shows you the algae in the shower. He shows you how pathetic and dirty the place is. And he takes the maids and the work staff and he goes through the whole place and says, you guys suck. I wouldn't put my dog in your hotel. And then he turns it around. Diligence. They've gotten sloppy. And they've got comfortable and sloppy. And the prophet does the same thing with businesses. This is not science. It's diligence. You start letting the little things go. Carpet stain. Uh, scratches on the wall. You can run a $50 million church complex into the ground just because you're not diligent. You neglect things that need repair. I can't see everything unless I walk by it. And when I do, I scream. I, if you're diligent and you work in a department or a classroom or an office and you see something out of order, if you see it, fix it. If you see it, say something. If, get somebody there to deal with it and deal with it quickly and you'll keep the value of something very high. How excellent are you? The Bible says our God is an excellent God. How come you so sloppy? The Bible says the righteous are more excellent than his neighbor. Even if you live in a ghetto, your little apartment, your little house can be clean and neat and your yard neat. It should stand out above your... If it looks like a weed patch in a junkyard, it tells me who you are. And you'll run down a neighborhood and lower the value of property. God says, that's not true of my kids. You don't have to be rich to be excellent. My grandmother used to sweep a dirt yard. Well, make me do it. But it was clean. It was dirt. No grass. Seymour, Texas. But it was clean. That's excellent. Does it make sense? Yeah. Let me tell you about a guy named Milton Hershey. Ever eat a Hershey bar? Milton Hershey was born in Pennsylvania on a farm September 1857. He went to a rural school till he was 14. Then he dropped out to go to work to help his family. Hershey went to work trying to make can candy. He worked for years. He failed. He went bankrupt in Chicago, moved to New York, failed again. Then he returned to Pennsylvania where he discovered the secret to making chocolate was fresh cow's milk. He began to make Hershey kisses and chocolate bars, and money started to flow like a river. Finally, his diligence began to pay off. Listen to how right and pure his work was. Hershey built the city named after him, Hershey, Pennsylvania. He built schools, churches, parks, and hospitals. He loaned money to his employees so they could buy and own homes. He built a trolley system so they could come to work from their homes. During the Depression, he hired every able-bodied man in town and gave them a job. Although unable to have children, he built a beautiful orphanage which stands to this day. Thousands of children could come and have a wonderful life. After they graduated from high school, he offered those with the ability, the opportunity to go to college, paid for. He did what was pure and right, driven by a spirit of excellence and an attitude of diligence in everything that he did. One person can really make a difference with diligence. With diligence, you can turn an average career into a great one. How many ever watched Duck Dynasty? This crowd doesn't watch anything. 
America's number one TV show with over 12 million viewers. How did this family from Monroe, Louisiana, come to such incredible success? Well, we know they're all committed people of faith. They make no apology for it. But the root of their success comes from the father who made the best duck callers anywhere in the southeast. His fame spread, and people came from everywhere to buy his duck callers because they were the best. That diligence paid off and made Duck Dynasty a reality, and the whole family are all living off the process and pro proceeds from the diligence of the Father. So what does your diligence factor look like? See, with diligence, you can turn a failing business into a prosperous business. Solomon said his work is pure and right. That means efficient and of highest quality every time, all the time. If you don't do it right the first time, when will you have time to do it again? See, until you do it right, it's not done. Everything you do is a portrait of you. If it's sloppy, you're sloppy. So do it right. That's how you get the attention of those in authority. Solomon says there are three kinds of people in this world. People who know what to do, but they lack the motivation to do anything. They can tell you what they ought to do. They can tell you what should be done but they won't lift a finger to do it. Then there are people who are impetuous, hasty. They act very quickly, but they give it no forethought, which usually brings disaster. And third, there's the diligent man who plans carefully. They look it over from top to bottom. Once the plan is drawn, they act swiftly. They move with confidence. This person fully expects to reach their objective. They're unafraid of critics and doubters. They get the plan, and then they walk it out one step at a time. So God says, the diligent will stand before kings, those in authority. Joseph, taken by his brothers, sold into slavery into Egypt, worked in Potiphar's house with diligent, although he was just a slave. He was a minority. He was of a different race, a different culture, put in this pagan's house. What got him promotion? He was put over all of Potiphar's house, over all of the servants. He was the ruler of everything. He alone told Potiphar what was what. It wasn't his race. It wasn't his nationality. It wasn't his IQ. It wasn't his good looks. Diligence. Potiphar said, after a season of having this kid, I don't have to tell this kid to do anything. He's amazing. I'm making him charge over everything. And that's how he got promoted. Well, then bad things happened again. A woman accused him of rape falsely. He was put in prison, left alone there, isolated, unnoticed. And he got promoted over all the prisoners. They opened his cell, gave him access to the library, gave him an iPad, iPhone, <laughs> gave him satellite TV. He could work out in the training room when he wanted to. He had full access to snacks and food. And he told everybody, what, what got him that promotion? Diligence. He didn't suck his thumb and say, well, it's a crud job. I'm going to do only what it takes to get by, make a living. He was just great at what he did. And wherever you put this kid, he just, like, he just kept coming to the top, just kept coming to the top. You couldn't stop him until one day he finally gets noticed, and he goes from the prison to the palace with full authority over the nation of Egypt, second to Pharaoh by diligence. What put him there? Brown nosing? No. Luck? No. Diligence. His work was pure and right year after year, day after day, unnoticed, unappreciated, and uncelebrated, and in one day he becomes a ruler. So let's take a look at the seven wisdom principle Solomon gives us about diligence, and it can change your life, it can change your marriage, it can change the year. 2015 and make it an incredible one for many of you. Number one, diligence will bring you insurmountable advantage. Proverbs 21, 5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, whether you're competing against companies, individuals, or circumstances. Diligence will give you a unique advantage that will result in greater productivity, achievement, wealth, and fulfillment. So what's your plan? See, if you have no goal, then no plan's going to get you there. Nothing in the world will take you there. Diligence was the driving force that empowered a man named Ray Kroc, 54 years of age, a salesman out of Chicago. 
who stopped in at a single restaurant in San Bernardino, California, selling milkshake mixer machines. And he wondered what on earth this company did, this business did, to order so many machines. And when he saw it, bingo, the light went off. It was owned by the McDonald brothers. And through this man's diligence, not the McDonald brothers, all they did was take his money, and they had no vision for the future. And it took a lot and a lot of time and years for Ray, through diligence, to negotiate his way into building this franchise and ultimately buying out the McDonald brothers so he could let the dream live. And he transformed that little one business into 25,000 across the nation and world called McDonald's. Ray wasn't lucky. He was diligent. It took him 30 years to become an overnight success. Yeah. Second, diligence will put you in control of the situation rather than the situation in control of you. Proverbs 12, verse 24. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. That means the slack man, the lazy man, the slothful man will always be told what to do. Your destiny will never be yours if you refuse to be diligent. Your competition, if you're a businessman, will dominate you. When you become diligent, you control the situation. The hand of the diligent will rule. Well, I hate people telling me what to do. Well, do it right. Do what he told you to do, and don't let the boss come by and say, well, you didn't get that, and you didn't do that. You're not diligent, so you're always under the rule of somebody else rather than being of such a quality that the boss says, you're in charge of building maintenance, you're in charge of security, you're in charge of this, and he doesn't have to tell you what to do. You're initiating it all the time. You're doing it with excellence. You're on the job. You're diligent. And you'll bring any problem that's beyond your control to him so he can get it done. That's the kind of a person that always gets promoted. He gets pretty well free reign what he wants. I want to tell that person, what do you want? What can I do for you? How can I make your job even easier? Is there anything that you need? What makes me want to do that? Because you're so valuable. You're diligent. I don't have to tell you, fix that. Did you notice the curtains torn? Did you notice there's a big black stain in the carpet? Get it out or get a new piece of carpet. And if you say that long enough, I hope before I die, somebody will actually remember it and do it without having to be told to do it. If you see tape on a door and it's we had a big sign up or something, and there's tape marks, and it took off paint. Duh, repaint it. You can take a $50 million facility and run it into the ground just by being undiligent in all these little things until pretty soon everything's torn up, everything's broken, nothing works right, and people walk in and think it's a third weight work. What did that? Lack of diligence. Oh, the silence is deafening in here. <laughs> This is for everybody, folks, me included. So when you become diligent, you rule. The hand of the diligent will rule. Well, Rick, I'm disadvantaged. Well, how about Helen Keller? She was blind and deaf, but with a gifted teacher and diligence, she was transformed from a bitter, hateful, and frustrated child until she graduated from college with honors and became one of the most inspirational writers and speakers of the 20th century. How'd she do that? Diligence. Oh, and what was your problem? <laughs> Number three, with diligence, you can experience true fulfillment. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the diligent is made fat. The vast majority of people in America stay in a perpetual state of hunger, not for food, not so much in America, but for things, for stuff. Today's Americans have more debt and lower savings than any generation in our nation's history. No matter what they have, it seems like it's never enough. Verse 46, the soul of the sluggard craves, but gets nothing. They never are fulfilled. That word soul refers to your innermost being. It's the source of the decision-making in your body. It's the very core of your personality and emotions. Made fat is not your waistline. It means you're at peace, you're contented, you're fulfilled man or woman. You crave nothing. 
With diligence, the soul of the diligent is made fat. It means you can look at somebody's beautiful home, and you have a nice home, smaller home, less of a neighborhood, and you don't chew the steering wheel off going home, cursing and upset and angry and mad and bitter because you don't have, you've got to have that dress, you've got to have that jewelry, you've got to have that pocketbook, you've got to have that car. That's an addiction. That's not a desire. That's a, an, a, an addiction. And they never have enough. What, what makes you a person who says, well, when I can afford that or if I can afford that, and if the opportunity comes, it's not wrong to enjoy that. But in the meanwhile, I don't need that to be happy. I can go look at your quarter of a million dollar car and be, find it remarkable and go, wow. But I don't go home unhappy. I can drive that Volkswagen home, be just as happy as anybody. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's never, well, I got to have a bigger house. And then I got to have a bigger house. I got to have two houses. Then I got to have four cars. I got to have five cars. Now, that's a, that's an, you just stay hungry. You just stay thirsty. And you're going to stay thirsty unless you let me quench it. I'm going to give you water, not H2O, but I'm going to give you something that will satisfy your soul, and you won't be thirsty again. You won't have to have another man. You won't have to chase another skirt. You won't have to have another fix. I'll fix you. And sure enough, he did, see? Because we all have these unmet needs and hunger and thirst in our heart. And so God says, if you're diligent, I'm going to fill you with contentment so that you crave nothing. Diligence turned a bookkeeper making 10 cents an hour into the richest and most powerful man in American history. His name, John D. Rockefeller. He made a million dollars a day before there was an IRS in 1913. And by the way, John D. Rockefeller was a tither. He gave regularly 10% of his income. By the way, so did J.C. Penney. You'll be shocked. These guys knew. They were raised in a culture that, that was very religious, that honored God. But these great entrepreneurs of the past were very charitable men. Very, very charitable men. They didn't consider themselves losing to give 10% of their income. They were very generous. They built homes and hospitals and orphanages. Why wouldn't God prosper them? They're doing something with it. Number four, diligence will bring you to the respect and admiration of people in authority. Verse 29, Proverbs 22, the person who is diligent in business will stand before kings. While everybody else is fighting and jockeying to be noticed, the diligent are sought out by rulers, presidents, CEOs, government officials, supervisors, and department heads. You want a springboard in your career? Then be diligent. You'll rise like a rocket off a NASA launching pad. One of my good friends who's preached here before and will again is Randy Morrison. Randy Morrison is an African-American guy that was raised in the Caribbean. He had a single mom, no dad. They came to this country when he was a teenager. He had $20 in his pocket. He said he got a job working in a metal factory, working metal works of some kind as a welder. He said he faced all the difficulties of racial bigotry and prejudice, and he decided the best way to whip it was to outwork everybody that he worked with to produce more and better quality. He said he did, and it didn't take but a couple of years for him to be promoted to foreman over the whole business. Later, God moved in his life, transformed his life. He went into the ministry and built, uh, uh, built a great church there in Minneapolis, Minnesota called Speak the Word Church, Randy Morrison. And if you think he's going to be easy on you because you came from an underprivileged background, he will kick your bottom. He will not allow you to do that. God will promote anybody if you're diligent. Don't suck your thumb, go into a fetal position in self-pity. You get diligent. You do it better than the other guy. You do more than is required, and you will come before those in authority. You can bet they will. One of the great characteristics of General Douglas MacArthur was his diligence. Yes, he was an egomaniac, but he had great qualities too. Everybody's flawed. But his attention to detail and his compulsion for excellence made him stand out. When America was caught unprepared by the attack on Pearl Harbor, the president turned to General Douglas MacArthur. He led us through the war in the Pacific with Japan. He structured the peace accord that ended World War II in Tokyo Bay. He was ready when the communist Chinese invaded Korea. He launched an ambitious and brilliant amphibious landing at Incheon. 
It was high risk. It was extremely dangerous. He got behind the Red Chinese Army and cut them off from their supplies. It was daring. It was brilliant. It was high risk. And it was a turning point in the Korean War. MacArthur made a speech to the Joint House of Congress after being forced into retirement by President Truman. He said, quote, in war, there is no substitute for victory. I love that. <laughs> What's sad is they're pacifist in the church. Your goal, your attitude for 2015 should be victory every time, all the time. I am in it to win it. I have to fight. I may have a setback. It may take longer than I thought, but it's not over till I win. We should only be surprised when we don't win. We should expect to be triumphant. Why does the Bible call us more than conquerors? That means you've got the victory before it's actually finished. It's a fixed fight. Don't be passive. Don't be compliant. Don't just huddle down and say whatever will be will be. No, no. My goal is victory every time. If God called you to build something, to buy something, to develop something, please, for God's sake, there's going to be problems. There's going to be unexpected challenges. There are going to be dramatic setbacks. Don't you even think about stopping. We wouldn't be here if we'd, have had, if we'd have followed that philosophy of not fighting and pressing through. And the best, well, the best is yet to come. Once the breakthrough occurs, boy, then the water just flows like a flood. And that's exactly what happens when breakthrough comes. So I, I got every reason to be hopeful and expectant. New challenges, new opportunities, n n new procedures, new creativity, new ideas. It's a great, great, great year if we're smart. Number five, the soul of the diligent, Solomon promises your needs will be satisfied. Proverbs 28, 19, he that tills the land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that follows vain people is void of understanding. That word vain means a foolish person. Solomon warns that if you stay, stray away from your field of endeavor, your strength, and you follow vain or foolish people and their advice, you're going to discover poverty. You'll be a sucker for a Ponzi scheme. You'll be looking for a quick fix. Get rich quick. Stay in your strength. Soar with your strength. Delegate your weakness. Made $19 million a week in Las Vegas back, I think it was the 70s. At that time, he was the highest paid entertainer on the Vegas Strip. And yet he went bankrupt. Excuse me. How do you go bankrupt on $19 million a week? What was his expertise? Entertainment. What made him wealthy? Entertainment. Singing. Music. Great personality. What got him bankrupt? Trusting people in a real estate ventures that he knew nothing about. And he lost it all. Don't get out of your strength. I have certain strengths and I have plenty of weaknesses. My future will never be where the weaknesses are. It's going to be where the strength is. And that's true for everybody. Don't copy somebody else. Don't let somebody else come to you with their grand plan and say, you make my destiny come true. No, no, you're here to fulfill your destiny, your purpose. Same for a church. Some guys, they think everything is about prophecy. Yea, yea, my son, the Lord would say unto you. Other churches build it on uh, an hour and a half of praise and worship. That's the main thing. That's the most important thing. Another church builds it on signs and wonders. How many people fall down? How many speak in tongues, etc. Other people build it on prayer. We've got to pray for over an hour, and we pray multiple times. None of those things are bad, but there are different callings and different purposes that God sets people up for. Others are politically involved, and then they want you to join their coalition in this. It comes to Midesk all the time. Just going downtown the other night, somebody's approached me and wants me to do this and wants me to do that only because they see me in an event with some very powerful people. It ain't about me. It's about them. But I know where my strength is, and I know what God's called me to do. I'm not a politician. I'm for everybody. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, or you climb a pole at a strip club. I'm for you. I want God to make something great out of your life. I'm glad you're here. I can't do that and get over here and become a right-wing white fundamentalist. I want to be like Jesus. If, if, if he said it's inerrant and it's true, then it's, that's good enough for me. I mean, I don't care what you think, what party you're in, what race or nationality. If it's true in the Scripture, it's true. I'm just going to side with that. That's it. I'm on Jesus' side, not on that guy's side or this party's side. And waste a lot of, of your life on pursuing something vain. So God says, don't 
do that. Don't take advice from people who don't have proven success. Be sure who, well, my Aunt Hazel told me. Well, what did Solomon tell you? Is it Solomon, God's Word, infallible, inerrant, inspired of God, or Aunt Hazel? Don't be dumb. Choose wisdom. And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I watch American Greed a lot, and I am amazed how people with no history of proven success can take millions and millions of dollars from gullible people. Don't be one. Be a wise person. Be discerning. Be excellent. So, don't go after rich quick. Labor. You'll be satisfied. Number six, the diligent will experience ever-increasing success. Proverbs 13, verse 11. Wealth gotten by vanity will diminish, but he that gathers by labor shall increase. That means wealth gained without hard work usually won't last. Lottery winners usually lose within two to three years everything they won unless they had a strong work ethic and they've been faithful and diligent in small things. Occasionally, they're wonderful. You get to see a beautiful winner who's a good person of character. They have good wisdom principles. Their life doesn't change. They're they're a credit. They improve everything around them, including their family. But in general, I watch the shows about lottery winners, and within two to three years, they're broke, they've lost it all, they're in jail, or they've been murdered. Wow, what a great payoff, huh? Even gamblers, lucky enough to win big in Vegas, eventually lose their winnings if they keep on gambling. The casinos in Las Vegas do not offer free penthouse suites to high rollers, whales, out of the goodness of their heart. Vegas is built on losers. The house is always favored to win. And they do it because they know no matter how much the guy wins, if he keeps playing, he's going to lose a lot more to the house. A child who inherits his father's business without learning to work hard and diligent himself will soon drive that business into the ground. Cindy and I bought tires from a company for 20-something years in this city that's now out of business. The father was excellent. He was diligent. The two key employees stayed with this man for 20-something years. I love them. One of them is a member of this church. And then when the father got cancer and died, the son took over, and he drove it into the ground, and it's gone. It didn't last two years. The same brand of tire was sold, Michelin's. The same two people were there. They were hired away by other companies. And what could have been a great profitable business to pass on to the son and to his children, gone because he was stupid. No wisdom at all. So if you've got a son in training, don't just keep giving him money. Make him work. And don't let him start in your office. Let him start out on the loading dock. Let him start out there where it's dirty and nasty. Let him learn how people behave out there and what they do so that when he takes over as leader, he's like Joseph. He, he started in prison. He knew all the scams. When it came time for him to rule the nation, he knew every lie, every crook, every scheme that could go on, and he became a great ruler. You're not going to start at the top. You're going to have to start with something that's not the best, but everybody does. Today's kids feel entitled. They're born on third base. They think they hit a triple. If, if children, many of our young, young adults and, and younger children have a great life, middle, middle class income or upper, and particularly if they came from a minority background, they don't even know what their parents suffered. They don't know the bigotry. They don't know the discrimination. They don't know how they were ungodly treated. They know nothing of that. They just sometimes run around like our kids do and act like a jerk. They don't realize the price those parents and grandparents paid to be where they are today and have no appreciation for it. It wasn't always that way. And our kids the same way. They don't know. They didn't see Daddy driving a Volkswagen with 200,000 miles on it with one suit that felt like cardboard, one suit living in a trailer. No, no. They see you 30 years later, and they say, oh, I want that. Well, I'll see you in 30 years, okay? <laughs> but that's, that's what happens. And they don't want to work. And they don't, I don't want that job. I don't, it doesn't pay enough. Well, it's too hard. Well, start with any job. 
and work your way up. That will make you manager of the store, then district manager, then regional manager, then give you a company car with perks and bonuses. But you don't have to stay where you start, but you got to start somewhere. I mean, this is, this is a country of opportunity. Tell those kids, cut the grass, vacuum the floor. When you hear, I'm bored, unplug the TV and computer. Give them a dozen things to do. God the Creator said, man shall live by the sweat of his brow. Work. W-O-R-K. That's a four-letter word that frightens a lot of people. It's godlike to work. It's a blessing to work. He worked six days and rested. And folks, nothing in your life will work until you do. The dictionary is the only place you're going to find success before work. So get off the couch. Get a job. Any job's a good place to start, but start somewhere. Number seven and last. Diligence always leads to prosperity. Always. How many people do you ever hear talking about doing great things and they never do anything? Proverbs 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Talk, 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 talk. You're going to have to do something if anything's going to change. See, talk is cheap. Diligent labor is demanding. It requires vision, creativity, commitment, effective partnering. When you feel like it or not, how diligent are... If I preached this weekend, I felt like it, I'd miss 25% of the Sundays. I told Cindy, I said, I don't have any reason why. I just feel poopy today. My shoulder hurts. I just didn't sleep good. I just don't think I'll go to church. You preach. <laughs> I'll watch you on live stream. <laughs> but I did tell somebody who just agreed with me, after you get up and do it anyway, you feel good. You feel better. I already feel better, but I didn't feel like it very much when I came. And I thought, God, can you do anything with the way I feel? A lousy attitude, don't feel that good. Anybody ever get up that way? But you still get up, you get dressed, you have your coffee, you know, you, you read a scripture, you offer a prayer, you drive to work, you get at it as hard as you can. You can't live by your feelings. You live by choice and decisions. If your marriage is not as fulfilling as you wish, you are not working diligently enough at it. Did you know the Bible says to us men, Dwell with your wives according to knowledge, meaning you got to be smart to stay married. Look around at people who've been married six, seven times and get them a sign. I love you, but in marriage, in that field, no wisdom. It takes wisdom to do, a, to do most things. It takes wisdom to know how to hunt a white-tailed deer. It takes wisdom as a good bass fisherman. It takes wisdom to tear down the engine of a car. It takes wisdom to stay married, and it takes diligence at it. You don't get lucky. Well, if I get rid of her, I'll get her. Then she'll be the right one. Then she'll be. No, they're all wired the same way. You got to get smart. They don't think like we think. They don't, they, you know, Cindy will get on me, and I'll have an attitude, or I'll say something, and she'll say, well, she just won't agree. She won't see it that way. And I'll go, why can't you see it that way? Because she's a female, and I'm a male. That's why. We're just different. You know that. How many books are there? Men are from Venus, women are from Mars, or whatever. We're different. And you just have to accept that or don't get married, one or the other. But you got to be smart to stay together because long after lust, rust, and dust wears off, you got to be smart. You, you know, at 80 years of age, you don't go to bed lusting. You don't wear lingerie, you wear flannel sweatsuits. Socks. <laughs> you remember we used to go to bed naked. I remember we were young. We were, we were... <laughs> now I got on a big sweatshirt and she got on grandma's pajamas and <laughs> got the dog sleeping up there with us too. So you're <laughs> Your choice is made every day when the sun comes up. Great lives are lived one day at a time with diligence. So let's review all seven. We're done. Number one, diligence will give you the advantage. 
Number two, diligence will give you control of the situation instead of that situation controlling you. Number three, diligence will cause you to experience true fulfillment. Number four, diligence will bring you before those in authority. Number five, diligence will satisfy your needs. Number six, diligence will bring you ever-increasing success. It gets better, and it gets better, and it gets better. And number seven, diligence will make your efforts profitable, and we all want that. Proverbs 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold? Because if you get gold and you're not smart, you'll lose it. If you got wisdom, you'll get gold. And to get understanding above silver. God says wisdom is the principal thing. So the critical component to becoming a diligent person is constantly pursuing wisdom and build your life, your career, your marriage, and your relationships on that great foundation, wisdom. This could be the best year of your life if in some cases you just stop doing dumb things and use wisdom. You play smart. Play smart. Play hard, but play smart. Be diligent in what you do. Little things matter. Stay on your game. Even when you don't feel up to the task, do the best you can do. Give it your best. This year will turn around. Long-standing issues are going to dissolve. God's going to lift your head above your adversaries. God will raise his favor upon your life. And what's going to be that turning point? Wisdom. You starting off the year with wisdom in the house of God, with God's people, with God's word that makes us smart people. You walk with wise people, you get smarter.